Okay, my name is uh, John Bamanek. I give a talk about uh, Barncat, a system I do that does uh, static uh, config ripping, uh, but I store and share all the data through MIPS, so I know that uh, uh, it's a rather large uh, MISP installation that's been uh, useful as a case study for the developers. So a little bit of background on me. Uh, I manage an intelligence team for a company called Fidela Cybersecurity. Uh, I'm a handler with the SANS Internet Storm Center. I also teach at the University of Illinois uh, in a computer science department. Uh, I like providing uh, open source intelligence uh, feeds and giving free data back so that uh, people can do interesting things that I don't have time to do uh, with the data. Uh, and I run several takedown oriented groups because uh, as a hobby, uh, I like putting actual miscreants behind bars. Uh, because that's the only way we can ever actually make this stop is arrest enough people. Uh, and uh, well. So I usually start with this particular slide of mo most of my talks to illustrate kind of the problem of the way I look at things. Uh, and this is just the virus total statistics page from either today or yesterday. I forget exactly when I did this. Uh, where you see that orange line is probably the most interesting, 350,000 unique malware sam unique distinct malware samples seen and detected by some uh, AV engine and virus tool, right? That's a huge number, so uh, how to tackle uh, about, uh, you know, malware at that scale to do disruptive things to actually kind of uh, tackle the problem of cybercrime. The reality is, is it's not actually 350,000 tools, it's a much smaller set. Uh, particularly when you're talking about commodity tools like remote access tools, uh, which is the disproportionate number of uh, malware uh, that I do uh, this work on, is used by a lot of different people, right? So if I'm going to say, you know what, I want to go uh, deal with somebody who's uh, cyber stalking somebody, right? You know, it's not the author of NJRAT, it's somebody who's using that because there's a subscription service. Uh, for some reason, people like calling this malware as a service. It's just you're licensing software, right? So I want to, I, I approach this as creating some tool to disambiguate the use of the tool to get to the actual individual behind it, right? With a large corpus of data set, you can do interesting things of that sort. Um, this system is based all on static malware analysis. Uh, the initial set of tools were actually developed by Kevin Breen, uh, Kev the Hermit on GitHub. Uh, we've developed uh, a couple dozen other decoders since then, but basically taking the binary file itself, unpacking what we can, and just getting the configuration items out of it. All malware is software, software has configuration. And as somebody does the work of intelligence, I love things that require free-form text fields because it is very hard for an individual to not give up something about themselves, even when they type on something random in there. And it, as, a, as an example, right, of who is. You register a domain, you can enter whatever name you want or any email address you want, uh, assuming you're not doing who is privacy. But you can correlate things or find patterns. There is a particular Chinese APT actor who apparently likes Marvel because all of his registered names are Tony Stark or using whatever uh, Marvel characters are. So there's a pattern I can find in the noise. It doesn't say anything more than that, but I can find a pattern to say, you know what, that person is doing this, right? Uh, and doing this, I was able to find just off the beaten path stuff, right? Uh, where I was able to uh, attribute somebody, uh, let's call a person of interest in a political assassination, right? Not typically work that we do, right? But I was able to do that with this and saying, you know what? You know, law enforcement authorities, you might want to talk to this person. You might know something about this uh, political figure who's assassinated, right? Um, so the idea is automating this, make it as fast as possible uh, so that uh, this is available to you, right? Starting with a feed of binaries, virus total is fine. Uh, I like telling organizations to mine their own spam folders. We like discarding data of junk, right? The most, e uh, not most, but a large portion of malware comes in via email. It's email, email or exploit kit. And if it's in the spam folder, we forget about it. But that's actually intelligence of people targeting your organization, right? So everybody's got that. And that's the most useful data that no one can sell you. Uh, using Yara antivirus uh, names to pre-select family and say, okay, this is poison ivy, run that decoder. Uh, and then put it into a database. Internally, we use, uh, we use Splunk for that. From Splunk, we load it into MISP. Um, uh, using the malware name as a tag, 
uh, and then loading the various configuration items, and I'll show you that in a couple of slides. Uh, so all of that, except for the feed of malware, assuming you're using VirusTotal, uh, is open source and free. Uh, not all of our decoders are open source, but there's a lot out there. Things you can do with it, you can sinkhole, victim notification, mining for correlations. Uh, but this, right, we're talking about MISP, is, is what I do is just share it back out because there's more things that I could ever dig into to actually investigate. Um, yeah, I create a feed, it goes into a product, you know, great, that's interesting. But of 230,000 some odd configs in my database with 150,000 more that are queued ready to go, there's no way I'm ever going to look at that and be able to tell interesting things, but could go to or go to a law enforcement partner or a Singapore cert or something and say, hey, you know what, take a look at this to find things targeting people in your country and then do something about that to enable that kind of work to happen. Right, uh, so that MISP instance has, has 1,200 users, which actually creates uh, its own uh, its own complication, which we'll talk about hopefully in a minute or two. So, as I said, every malware has its own set of configuration items. It varies between families because not everybody <coughs> does the things the same way. There's some obviously that are consistent, right? You know, where is the C2? What IP domain port? Right. The rest of it could be anything. Right. Uh, some of these have default values, and this actually created a complicating problem because one of the strengths of MISP is the correlation engine to say, hey, all of these things are related, right? Well, I've got probably 40,000 dark comet samples, right? Seeing 40,000 little click, click, clickable links to other dark comet samples is not particularly useful, and it breaks the web interface, it actually breaks the database, right? Uh, guess 16 is the default campaign ID for dark comet. Correlating off that is meaningless because it's the default value. Uh, but some uh, have freeform text fields. Some are just purely randomly generated. Um, uh, Mutex, for instance, and in a lot of things is randomly generated to prevent multiple copies of the same malware running. Most attackers, even if they're smart enough to clear all the freeform text fields and make everything different, typically don't click re-randomize on Mutex or for randomly generated uh, registry keys which means I could take that otherwise meaningless piece of data and say, you know what? A seven-digit alphanumeric string, right, is not terribly cryptographically strong, but the odds of it organically occurring twice with two different people is very small. So I could turn around and say, you know what? These seven malware attacks were all related, and that gets me towards, I mean, not sufficient, but gets me towards uh, the corpus to actually attribute somebody. As an example, this is what Dark Comet looks like. You see the default campaign ID of guest 16. In there is also FTP user and password, because Dark Comet, as some of you probably know, will FTP, use FTP uh, to store key logs. So I've got access credentials to the criminal's uh, <coughs> FTP server uh, where I could delete key logs or do any interesting things, which I you know, would never admit in a public forum because I'm sure doing anything malicious to them is a crime in almost every jurisdiction, but that data is there. And password is uh, another awesome thing to correlate off of, right? Because very few people, even if they choose 17 ones for a password, that will not organically happen with, uh, with two different individuals. As you see, NJRAT, different set of things. There's a registry value, a different, well, actually, that's not a default port. I forget what the default port for NJRAT is. <laughs> Um, you know, but you see dynamic DNS, other things that may or may not be relevant. If you aggregate all of that, right, it's this mess of things, of configuration items. I can't make that in, I, like, I suppose I could make it into a 1,000 column CSV if I hated people. <laughs> and I kind of do, but I hate criminals more. I want this to be useful. Um, you know, so storing it like in, in even in uh, any sticks or whatever is just not ideal because it's just so many different things, right? You know, my DGA fields are all CSV, right? Uh, for those who use my domain generation algorithms, because it's domain, resolved IP, name server, name server IP, that's four fields, and then a couple of text descriptions, right? Make that CSV convert into anything you want. I can't do that with um, something that that's complicated. So putting it in the MIST, I only extract a couple of things and make it its own item. Um, but the way I did it had to change a little bit. I'm going to guess that you can't see much of this because I'm having trouble here on the first line. 
But the entire config I encapsulate in JSON config, that, that item. So you can extract that, put it into anything. If you do, um, if you Splunk, Elk, whatever you want to use for data analytics, right? That's the thing that you really want. Uh, because this, I use this as a sharing platform. I suppose you could do analytics and all of the other modules that come with it in my MISP instance, but that's probably less ideal for, for how this data was created. Uh, I do pull out IP address or a domain uh, up there on the top, right? Joker, Joker, ATEF, Hopto.org, another 9DNS with an IP address in there. So you see, what, six, five uh, correlated entries. Uh, but all the, some of these I just put in as comments because I didn't want that correlation engine to work because uh, at least, what, a year and a half ago when I did this, if you got much over 10,000 related <laughs> items to a single thing, then things broke in bizarre ways and it actually stopped working. Uh, but it's also not terribly useful at a certain point. Um, like I said, this is more of a sharing platform than it is to, hey, go do your analysis in this. It's just a means to get data out there uh, to a lot of people. Uh, and actually, one other thing that I did, had to do uh, is the way that MISP uh, generates exports. Um, <coughs> originally, I put in everybody by their affiliation and created, I don't even know how many affiliations of those 1,200 users. It's probably near 1,000 because I probably only get one user per organization. So once I got over, I don't know, 100 some odd organizations creating exports of a quarter million entries, uh, for each individual organization, when really the export was the same, was just brutal on disk space, and, and that was just the easy problem. So everything is in their own organization is just Barncat users, where I just got rid of, uh, just administratively just discarded that functionality, just to make the purpose of creating export files a lot easier. So what can you do with this, right? Um, you know, if you receive a sample, right, you can check some of the configuration items in this database to start correlating uh, activity backwards um, and uh, to try to get context or something about the attacker, right? Uh, you can't really find a pattern with one data point. The key is to find multiple data points where you can now discern, hey, this is the type of behavior somebody goes on, uh, that goes on that, that's in their mind, who they're targeting, whatever, assuming that you have that data. Uh, and you can also hunt for interesting things. Like I said, I mentioned uh, the political assassination case. I just kind of did that on a whim uh, based on somebody else's open source reporting and see if I can go all the way back to attribute, uh, well, to an email address, an actual email address, which law enforcement can turn into an identity. But you can find interesting things. So as an example is this slide, which um, I'll point out the interesting config items on this one. Right, Nick Red Sutz, the zero one five JS Zapto. That nickname in there, which is in essence a campaign ID for JSocket. JSocket is a, uh, was a Java based malware uh, cross platform. August twenty four RD bombing. That RD is actually important, um, and we'll get to why that is in a second. But August twenty fourth, the first time I saw this, is like that is oddly specific, right? And I remember it's like. Uh, you know, that date rang a bell for me uh, for something. And it was this event, right? As, as somebody who started my career following terrorism a little bit, uh, August 24th, 2004, there were two uh, airliners in Russia's Domodedovo airport uh, that were blown up in terrorist attacks, right? And I'm, those of you who follow terrorism, you know, know that they have a thing for anniversaries. So I says, okay, that's an awfully specific reference to a very specific terrorist attack, you know, on an anniversary, which can lead to an assumption, right? Uh, people seeing that would say, hey, this could be terrorist-related malware, just based on the correlation of that alone, and I'm sure you've seen articles and blog posts saying as such. Um, I said, uh, it's a Java-based malware, has a strong Latin American user base, uh, one user has interesting Hezbollah ties, so that context kind of reinforces, hey, this, this is known with those uh, threat of actors. Uh, so, uh, and they do communicate, but say, hey, let's go and look more in the database and see what else we can find, right? That's a US-based IP address uh, where it's always pointed, it was been there uh, the entire time, but going back in the data, and you're probably not gonna see this, 
but looking at all the instances of JSOC that had the word bomb in the title, right, or bomb in the nickname, uh, you'll see uh, there's September 3rd, there is 1st July, uh, August, uh, September 3rd. Uh, so what happened was this person just called their Spam the Earth campaigns bombing rocks, right? And when they went in and changed the date from August 3rd to August 24th, they just removed August 3rd, August 3, and just typed in August 24, leaving the RD artifact, right? So I was able to say, no, this is just his nomenclature, not actually a terrorist. So having greater understanding of what an actor is and not making superficial conclusions uh, and having more data. Um, as an example, right, you know, of campaign IDs, the most uh, prevalent campaign ID uh, is a default value. You see that it's guest 16. There's one with guest 16 and an underscore. But even this, some of this gives you data. You'll see Vidima uh, is Portuguese uh, for victim, I believe. Kurban is Turkish, uh, also for victim, I believe. Uh, so the use of those languages uh, gives you something, probably not enough to correlate off of. But if you see, you know, that fourth column, DH Jetor, uh, you know, that might be somebody interesting. It's an oddly specific name. Let's see what this person has been doing and see what IP address and hosts he's been using all the time, uh, which is important because for anybody who's ever actually uh, kind of helped law enforcement to figure things out, is the key to a successful prosecution is to map uh, for anything other than script kids who are just stupid and make mistakes is to map their activity over a year worth of time, right? Or two years worth of time to figure out the one time they screwed up and left data behind <laughs> or left something that you can turn into an identity for a prosecution. Um, attackers know this kind of analytics goes on. Uh, I'll show you an example on another slide, but there is malware configuration with non-operational data, right? So as an example, a C2 of 127.001. It's malware, right? That's what it's configured to. Found its way to VirusTotal or wherever. Uh, you know, so will never actually lead to a successful infection in the real world. But even then, going back and saying, okay, what are the other artifacts of that configuration and do they map to something that was ever live? Because malware authors will often test things, particularly against VirusTotal for detection, right? I'm going to upload this and see if anything detects. That's less so because there are services that more cater to criminals of doing that. Uh, but sometimes it's junk data, sometimes it's researchers, sometimes it's actually criminals who are testing, playing around, and then will operation, operationalize their data later uh, and then reuse some of those configuration items. Uh, or it just could be, like I said, attackers trying to manipulate uh, automated feed generation and security vendors who don't apply appropriate whitelisting, which brings me to my point. If you use my data, cool, use my data, do interesting things, but validate it before you put it into a firewall or RPZ or whatever, because this is not clean data, right? It's something that criminals put out there and they can't do troll, right? Um, so the same is true for any data, right, that you get in any list. Do some validation uh, after doing that. So as an example, I said you probably can't see this in the back of the room, but there's a dark comment. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, dark comment. Uh, but the domain you see, the C2 there is set to 8.8.8.8. Everybody knows what that is, right? It's Google's DNS server. Google has no reason to run a remote access tool because they have their search logs. They've got all their data anyway. Um, you know, but that's actual malware and actual config in there. And if you put that into some kind of automated feed, you know, somebody's going to get very angry with you. So it's just for the point of, um, of saying this, this data needs to be post-validated before it's operationalized. It's very useful for intelligence nonetheless, but going from intelligence to operationalization requires more steps than just extracting those IOCs from this. Uh, if you want access to that, uh, you can, uh, there's a URL. Uh, you can give me a business card here. Uh, and I can give you access. There's uh, 236,000 malware configs in there right now, but there's about 150,000 more that are in a queue once there's a, a bug that needs fixing. Uh, you know, but I recommend anyway, bring that data local. Don't, don't necessarily even do it in this if you're doing 
uh, the kind of intelligence analytics I talked about, uh, you know, where you want to basically data mine it, there, there are better tools for that, but it's, uh, I picked this, or I picked MISP uh, because it saved me the effort of developing a sharing platform, and it works uh, pretty well for that. Uh, I do use MISP internally for our intelligence collection also, uh, but this particular instance, like I said, it was very useful for the use case that I had, uh, so from here, like, go do good stuff with it, right? You know, put people in prison, go protect broader society, right? It's free, I'm not gonna sell you anything over it, you know, I'm not commissioned anyway, so um, go have fun. Uh, so, uh, Kevin Brain, uh, a lot of people on my team had a lot to do with this, so thanks to them. Any questions? <coughs> I will upload these slides to SlideShare once once I'm done here, so don't feel the need to, to take a lot of pictures, because I'll just publish them online. Uh, questions? Do you let me off easy? You're all scared. Hmm? You're all scared. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mostly harmless. Okay. Thank you.